Hi guys. It has turned into a spectacularly gorgeous Sunday afternoon after being a cool cloudy day. It is my last day in Mexico and I want to get out there and since I can't find a margarita in this collapsing town uh, of Chulha, Mexico, uh, I'm going to go have one last beer in Mexico on this beautiful day over this beautiful lake, but uh, since I'm not going to be able to do a video tomorrow, I'm just going to preload one, so we'll pretend like it is Monday, February 13th. I want to send a um, big thank you out to alert listener Roy for sending me, you know, he's been enjoying listening to me bitch and whine about uh, Mexico and about this, uh, anyway, uh, so he found this essay, okay, from 1927 from my hero H.L. Mencken. H.L. Mencken, if you are not uh, aware of this man's work, M-E-N-C-K-E-N. -E -E you should look it up. And the name of this essay from 1927 is The Lib Libido for the Ugly. And uh, if you don't know who this is, journalist H.L. Mencken was renowned for his playfully combative prose style and his politically incorrect points of view, first published in Prejudice's sixth series in 1927, Mencken's essay, The Libido for the Ugly, stands as a powerful exercise in hyperbole and invective. Note his reliance on to use a term, concrete examples and precise descriptive details. Okay, and I will come back and make a few comments, especially about that word concrete, because remember this was written in 1927. So as you're reading this, especially if you've traveled in Latin America, I guess Eastern Europe, do remember that these words were written uh, before the infamous concrete block, the cinder block, you know, the hollowed out cinder block became the, uh, you know, the construction item of choice for those with the libido for the ugly. It came out well before tin roofing came out and it certainly uh, preceded the mountains and mountains and mountains of plastic garbage uh, littering uh, this planet, particularly my guess is all over the global south. So H.L. Mencken never got to see this concrete block, uh, soul-sucking uh, architecture he never got to see these tin roofs, and he never got to see mountains of plastic. But even in 1927, sounding a little bit like uh, Miguel Cervantes uh, in the year 1605. But take it away, H.L. Mencken, what was the view from 1927, the libido for the ugly? <clears throat> On a winter day some years ago, coming out of Pittsburgh, so some years before 1927, on a winter day some years ago, coming out of Pittsburgh on one of the expresses of the Pennsylvania Railroad, I rolled eastward for an hour through the coal and steel towns of Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania. It was familiar ground, boy and man, I had been through it often before, but somehow I had never quite sensed its appalling desolation. Here was the very heart of industrial America, 
the center of its most lucrative and characteristic activity, the boast and pride of the richest and grandest nation ever seen on earth. And here was a sense, here was a scene so dreadfully hideous, so intolerably bleak and forlorn that it reduced the whole aspiration of man to a macabre and depressing joke. Here was wealth beyond computation, almost beyond imagination, and here were human habitations so abominable that they would have disgraced a race of alley cats. I am not speaking of mere filth, of mere filth. Well, as I say, Mencken, I, I, I don't know if Mencken ever experienced anything close to the filth, just the, just the constant in-your-face, soul-sucking filth of, of traveling through Latin America a uh, hundred years uh, after he wrote this. Uh, I don't know if he could even imagine it. But anyway, back to Mencken. I am not speaking of mere filth. What expects steel towns to be dirty? What I allude to is the unbroken and agonizing ugliness, the sheer revolting monstrousness of every house in sight from East Liberty to Greensburg, a distance of 25 miles, there was not one in sight. Nah, damn it, that sun is not going to help me read this. Uh, there was not one in sight from the train that did not insult and lacerate the eye. Some were so bad and they were among the most pretentious churches, stores, warehouses, and the like, that they were downright startling. One blinked before them as one blinks before a man with his face shot away. A few linger in my memory, horrible even there. A crazy little church just west of Jeanette set like a dormer window on the side of a bare leprous hill. The headquarters of the veterans of foreign wars at another forlorn town. A steel, sto a steel stadium like a huge rat trap somewhere farther down the line. But most of all, I recall the general effect of hideousness without a break. There was not one single decent house within eye range from the Pittsburgh suburbs to the Greenberg yards. There was not one that was not misshapen and there was not one that was not shabby. The country itself is not uncomely despite the grime of the endless mills. It is in form a narrow river valley with deep gullies running up into the hills. It is thickly settled, but not noticeably overcrowded. There is still plenty of room for buildings, even in the largest towns, and there are very few solid blocks. Nearly every house, big and little, has space on all four sides. Obviously, if there were architects of any professional sense or dignity in the region, they would have perfected a chalet to hug the hillsides, a chalet with a high-pitched roof to throw off the heavy winter storms, but still essentially a low and clinging building wider than it was tall. <clears throat> but what have they done? They have taken as their model a brick set on end. This they have converted into a thing of dingy clapboards, 
with a narrow, low-pitched roof, and the whole they have set upon thin, preposterous brick piers by the hundreds and thousands. These abominable houses cover the bare hillsides like gravestones in some gigantic and decaying cemetery on their deep sides. They are three, four, and even five stories high. On their low sides, they bury themselves swinishly in the mud. Not a fifth of them are perpendicular. They lean this way and that, hanging on to their bases precariously, and one and all, they are streaked in grime with dead and eczematous patches of paint peeping through the streaks. <laughs> He's doing a pretty good uh, description of these buildings in uh, Mexico I'm looking at from where I'm having this rant. Now and then there is a house of brick, but what brick? When it is new, it is the color of a fried egg. When it is taken on the patina, the patina of the mills, it is the color of an egg long, long past all hope or caring. Was it necessary to adopt that shocking color? No more than it was necessary to set all the houses on end. Red brick, even in a steel town, ages with some dignity. Let it become downright black, and it is still slightly, especially if its trimmings are of white stone with soot in the depths and the high spots washed by the rains. But in Westmoreland, they prefer that uremic yellow brick. And so they have the most loathsome towns and villages ever seen by a mortal eye. I award this championship only after laborious research and incessant prayer. I have seen, I believe, all of the most unlovely towns of the world. And they are all to be found in the United States. Again, I don't know if Mencken ever traveled in Latin America. I have seen the mill towns of decomposing New England and the desert towns of Utah, Arizona, and Texas. I am familiar with the back streets of Newark, Brooklyn, and Chicago, and have made scientific explorations to Camden, New Jersey, and Newport News, Virginia. Safe in a Pullman, I have whirled through the gloomy, God-forsaken villages of Iowa and Kansas, and the malarious tidewater hamlets of Georgia. I have been to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and to Los Angeles, but nowhere on this earth, at home or abroad, have I seen anything to compare with the villages that huddle along the line of the Pennsylvania from the Pittsburgh Yards to Greensburg. Uh, I remember doing a rant about the day I found myself in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which I think is the hometown of Joe Biden. Scranton, Pennsylvania is a true pit from hell. I know exactly what this man is talking about. They are incomparable in color, and they are incomparable in design. It is as if some titanic and aberrant genius, uncompromisingly inimical, inimical to man, had devoted all the ingenuity of hell to the making of them. They show grotesqueness of ugliness, that, in retrospect, becomes almost diabolical. One cannot imagine mere human beings con concocting such dreadful things, 
and one can scarcely imagine human beings bearing life in them. Are they so frightful because the valley is full of foreigners, <coughs> dull, insensate brutes with no love of beauty in them? Then why did not why did not these foreigners set up similar abominations in the countries that they came from? You will in fact find nothing of the sort in Europe, save perhaps in the most putrid parts of England. Uh, there is scarcely an ugly village on the whole continent. So again, guys, I have never traveled to what I consider probably to be the ninth ring of hell, which is Eastern uh, Europe. I have, you could no more drag me to Poland or Belarus than uh, the very thought of traveling in Eastern Europe. Uh, good God. Uh, so maybe in 1927, before you know, before World War II, uh, some of what Mencken was saying. But I assure you, I mean, just looking at videos, I can't remember my buddy. There's a word for these uh, blocks of concrete, kabushka or something like that. Bushtrovka. Kroschovka. I don't think Mencken would today write the words, there is scarcely an ugly village on the whole continent of Europe. Uh, the peasants, you know, in Europe before 1927, however poor, somehow managed to make themselves graceful and charming habitations, even in Spain. But in the American village and small town, the pull is always toward ugliness. And in that Westmoreland Valley, it has been yielded to with an eagerness bordering upon passion. It is incredible that mere ignorance should have achieved such masterpieces of horror. On certain levels of the American race, indeed, there seems to be a positive libido for the ugly, as on other and less Christian levels, there is a libido for the beautiful. It is impossible to put down the wallpaper that defaces the average American home of the lower middle class to mere inadvertence, or to the obscene humor of the wallpaper manufacturers. Such ghastly designs, it must be obvious, give a genuine delight to a certain type of mind. They meet in some unfathomable way in obscure and unintelligible demands. They caress it as the palms caress it, or the art of Lancier, or the ecclesiastical architecture of the United States. The taste for them is an enigmatical, enigmatical, and yet as common as the taste for vaudeville, dogmatic theology, sentimental movies, and the poetry of Edgar A. Guest, or for the metaphysical speculations of Arthur Brisbane. Now, I have to admit, I'm not uh, getting a lot of these cultural references from 1927. Thus, I suspect, though confessedly without knowing, that the vast majority of those honest folk of Westmoreland County, Pennsylvania, and especially the 100% American among them actually admire the houses they live in and are proud of them. For the same money, they could get vastly better ones, but they prefer 
what they have got. Certainly, there was no pressure upon the veterans of foreign wars to choose the dreadful edifice that bears their banner, for there are plenty of vacant buildings along the trackside, and some of them are appreciably better. They might indeed have built a better one of their own, but they chose that clabbered horror with their eyes wide open, and having chosen it, they let it mellow into its present shocking depravity. They like it as it is. Beside it, the Parthenon would no doubt offend them. In precisely the same way, the authors of the Rat Trap Stadium that I have mentioned made a deliberate choice after painfully designing and then erecting it, they made it perfect in their own sight by putting a completely impossible penthouse painted a staring yellow on top of it. The effect is that of a fat woman with a black eye. It is that of a Presbyterian grinning, but they like it. Here is something that the psychologists have so far neglected. The love of ugliness for its own sake. The lust to make the world intolerable. Its habitat is the United States. Out of the melting pot emerges a race which hates beauty as it hates truth. The etiology of this madness deserves a great deal more study than it has got. There must be causes behind it. It arises and flourishes in obedience to biological laws and not as a mere act of God. What precisely are the terms of those laws and why do they run stronger in America than elsewhere? Let some honest private docent, whatever that means, in pathological soci sociology apply himself to this problem. <laughs> uh, I need to uh, read more H.L. Mencken. He sounds like my kind of guy. Uh, I'm pretty sure that H.L. Mencken uh, would be a doomer if he were alive to see uh, how the American model of, of justice, the, the libido for ugliness has moved on to the rest of the world and now the entire planet. Uh, it's, uh, it, I, I mean, just pretty much anything made by humans, invented by humans, built by humans, trashed by humans, uh, it, it, it's, it's become one, it, it's just become one planetary trash dump. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to, and, and this town is actually one of the cleaner towns. There's actually signs warning that you will be arrested and given a 12,000 peso fine if you're caught littering in Chulha, uh, Mexico. So I'm going to go wade through the detritus of the scoff laws of Chulha, sweep me a little uh, gringo-sized piece of, uh, of abandoned rooftop and enjoy a beautiful view of Laguna Azul for the last time, I highly suggest you get out there and uh, scrape out your own landing while you still can. Bye, guys.